whatever your insecurities are, if you are speaking those and you're feeling those in your most vulnerable moments, that's going to show up for you. Welcome. I'm Diane Flores, a former overweight, unhealthy, single teen mom living on all forms of government assistance turned IFBB bodybuilding professional. And I'm also the creator of Venus Fitness Studio, which is an all women's personal training gym with a team of personal trainers transforming lives in our community of Modesto, California. I'm also the founder of the Goddess Body Elite competition team with athletes all around the world and a team of coaches helping women achieve greatness they never thought possible. But it wasn't all that long ago that I lacked the knowledge, the confidence, the budget, and the time to focus on changing my own health, my own body, and mindset. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, I stepped on stage 16 times, earned the prestigious title of IFBB Pro, and in that process have created a formula for our clients that's changed lives and gives me more freedom and confidence in my own body than I ever thought possible one that only existed as a daydream. My team and I now teach others through training clients in the studio, online programs, competition coaching, and now this podcast that you're listening to. I created the Boss Bitch Radio podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you make profound changes in your life. If you're an ambitious fitness junkie or one in the making who's looking to up-level your confidence, create a body, mindset, and a life that you love, you are in the right place, Boss Bitch Bestie. I freaking love you, and let's get started. Hey, bitches, are you ready to dive in? I'm very excited about this topic today. Super, super passionate. I have lots to go over. But my question to you is, do you feel like you lack confidence? And I know that's a very broad question because there can be areas of your life where you feel super confident, right? Maybe your job, your profession as a parent, you're very confident in your skills there. And then other areas of your life where you're like, not so much. And I think that's pretty normal. But we're going to dive into a lot around confidence and some other key topics. But I also want you to think about, oftentimes, are you seeing other women so confident and thinking to yourself, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could show up in the world like that. Not necessarily, I wish I could look like that, right? But more so how you see someone move through the world. I know I hear oftentimes, you know, I'm I'm envious of how confident you are, of how direct you are, how bold you are, how brave. I hear this often. These are words that come through as I'm sitting here at my desk. I save a lot of love notes from my clients, whether they're emails or cards they've written to me. And I see a reoccurring theme of words that people use to describe me, right? Which very, very grateful for. But when I hear these things, the first thing that goes through my head is how can I share with women how I got here, right? I still feel that there's work to be done. I mean, you're you're never done doing the work, at least, I feel like, in some way, shape, or form. However, it was not always like this for me. So I'm going to share a bit about my story and we'll dive into the changes that I've made throughout my life to get to where I am today. And I, like I said, still think the work is not done and the things that I'm setting out to accomplish are going to require a new level of boss bitchery, but I'm here for it. So I want to dive in today about multiple topics, like what is confidence by definition? We'll go over that. Understanding confidence and insecurity We're also going to go over faking confidence versus building genuine confidence. And I talk a lot about that because, y'all, I had to fake it to make it, right? Like I had to fake it a lot because I did not see the end goal. So we'll talk about that and some tactical tips on how to boost confidence as well. Now, probably my favorite piece of this entire podcast is going to be the segment on overcoming imposter syndrome. And I say it my favorite because I see a lot of women do this, and I was guilty of this myself. And I think this is what stops us oftentimes from moving forward 
in certain areas of our life. So we're going to spend probably a lot of time on that because a lot of times we get in our own way. So we're going to go over some great things to, to consider. We'll also cover embracing your vulnerability, which I truly believe is a superpower and how I have essentially made it to where I'm at today, which I feel incredibly blessed and successful and also self-acceptance because we can go down a rabbit hole of negative self-talk and then that will reflect in your confidence day to day and your confidence in the things that you're maybe a little wary of or you're not feeling 100% confident. So self-acceptance is huge. Then we'll talk about uh, skill development as far as building confidence through that. And then also body language, right? Embodying confidence and body language. And I think I have a lot of, of experience with that piece of it, especially as a as someone who identifies as an introvert by nature and a lot of times my introvertedness would come off as unapproachable or resting bitch face and if you can resonate with any of those strap in bitches because we got some shit to talk about let's get started so we're going to dive into confidence so what is confidence so by definition it is a fundamental aspect of personal development and success, but it is the belief in one's abilities, skills, and judgment. So when you embody confidence, this empowers you to tackle challenges, right? Take risks, embrace opportunities with a positive outlook, not a fearful outlook or or being afraid of what can, can go wrong. Now, in my opinion, confidence plays a significant role in various areas of our lives. Like I mentioned earlier, career growth, social interactions, overall well-being, how you interact with your family. You can feel real confident in your, you know, whether you're a mom or your dad or your step parent, you can be really confident in certain areas of life. And then you got one area and you're like, mm, my body, not so much, right? So how can we meld your skills with your confidence in areas that you feel very solid in and roll that over, or at least the same principles, roll those over into the areas in which you're not confident or comfortable. So a lot of the areas that most women struggle with that I find are obviously struggles with their body confidence, but sometimes also their ability to deal with criticism and not letting that like cripple them and make moves forward. And then it just kind of sets them back, but also advancing their careers, right? Job interviews, public speaking, networking events, putting yourself out there to push yourself outside your comfort zone. So being insecure and not confident will hold you back in so many areas other than just body insecurity, which is what we, which I deal with a lot most often. And honestly, one of my biggest passions in my life is sharing with women and giving them the ability to know that they have it within them to be incredibly powerful, very confident, and not to take this as, well, this means I'm cocky or I'm boastful or I have a big head or whatever some other insecure person is telling you that might be and running towards it and embracing it. And I've talked before on the podcast, I do feel there's a distinct difference in being confident and being cocky. And it's a fine line that some people can cross. And I think sometimes I cross over it, but I do it in a more of like a fun and playful way. But I'm also very aware of my starting point and knowing how far I've come from the beginning, right? Like Drake says, we started from the bottom and now we're here. So next up, let's dive into a little bit of my story so I can share with you essentially my thought process and the unfolding of becoming a boss bitch. So psychologically, I was set up to feel very insecure. We're going to go with that because growing up, 
I didn't come from money. My parents, you know, I, I like to say we weren't poor, but we were broke and we didn't have a lot of the fun things and the luxuries that a lot of my friends in elementary school had. You know, my parents ended up getting divorced. And so life was a little challenging growing up. Now, I'm very blessed and very grateful for what I did have. And my parents did their best. But being confident wasn't something I was raised you know, I wasn't raised in a confident household in terms of like, my parents were constantly feeding me words of affirmation and pumping me up and telling me to chase my dreams. Like none of that shit was happening. Okay. My dad was like, you need to work. School's a waste of time and just get to it because you're a teen mom and we ain't got time for you to go to school. You need to work. So that was essentially how I grew up. And my own personal self-esteem journey was very, very challenging because I got teased often in school. I got made fun of my clothes because my parents often shopped at like Kmart or consignment shops. My mom was like a big yard sailor. You know, I didn't have the luxuries of a lot of my friends, right? I, I was telling a girlfriend of mine the other day that when it was time to go school shopping, we would put our clothes on layaway at Kmart. And my parents would have to make payments on our school clothes up until school came because they couldn't just spend, you know, a couple hundred bucks on on my sister and I for school. So I was always going into a public school setting, feeling very insecure and teased about my Payless shoes and my Kmart clothes and and all these things. And so it, it kind of set the tone for me going into middle school and high school as always feeling very, very insecure and uh, not quite the most confident. Then it turned into becoming a teen mom. Right. And then the insecurities were insurmountable as far as how I felt about myself early on. It was like, no one will want me. I'm broken. I'm on, you know, every aid known to man from the state. But I knew I was a good person with value. I knew as I was a hard worker. And yes, I was relying on government assistance, but I was also busting my ass. I was working 40 hours and I was also working on the weekends at Gold's Gym in the daycare because I could take my kids with me. So I was working, you know, 40 to 60 hours per week. I knew I had the value of hard work instilled in me. And so with time, this confidence started to build within myself because I saw myself start to change from a young woman with two small children whose father left, whose, you know, their, my partner at the time, their father left the picture before my daughter was even walking. So I was a mom of two very small children solo. I was able to move out of my parents' house. I was able to, you know, get my first car. And I started to build in these little financial pieces of confidence where I knew that if I worked hard and I put my mind to something, I could figure it out. Now, I didn't know this at the time really as as I do now, but I knew that there was more for me than my perceived destiny. Like I knew there I was I was capable of more. I knew that I was definitely destined for something more than what I was doing at the time. I just didn't know what it was. I could feel it in my soul and I would see things and I would see people who were doing very successful things at that time to me, which was different realms of like fitness and financial things. And I'm like, if they can do it, so can I. Just because I have two kids, just because I have these odds stacked against me does not mean that I'm not smart enough or capable enough. I do believe there was a point in my life where I thought, well, I need to have this like degree and I need to, I need to have like a degree. I need to have more knowledge from like a, you know, an, a school perspective as far as my education goes. Um, and so I tried, you know, I tried to get into college to be a nurse. And well, I went in to be a PE teacher, talked to the counselor, and they're like, you don't want to do that. Um, It's not going to provide you the outcome in terms of revenue that you're probably wanting. So dabbled in some things there. And then I just realized that the standard model of education just did not fit well for me. The way that I learn, my current circumstances with my children, and the things that I wanted to achieve, I knew were going to be bigger than me just like punching a time clock. I knew that for myself. I'm like, something about my life is going to help other people. Something about the struggles I've gone through and let's just keep going. So besides my desire to just work hard and have better things for myself and my children, 
it was important that I had a role model. So when you can have somebody that you can look up to that you're like, okay, this person motivates me. This person has done it is incredibly transformative. Now, for me, my personal role model wasn't necessarily because of his monetary achievements. It was more so his story. So my dad came here to this country when he was 13 years old and he had zero education and like one pair of shoes and he could not go to school traditionally here in the States because his parents were like, we need you to work on bringing in money for the family, right? Because like back in the day, that's what people did back in the day. Like the kids worked and like the family was like to support the family. So I always knew that like if my dad could come here as English second language, did not know how to speak English whatsoever, used to sell cabbage on the back of a donkey in the Azores Islands barefoot. If he could come here, find a job and provide for his family and figure it all out, then I can certainly figure out how to be successful and live a life that I'm going to be very happy with. So I knew it. If he could do it, I can do it. My dad is very resilient. He's very persistent. He's very resourceful. And he doesn't sit still very long. And I'm like, that's, yeah. So I I embody a lot of my dad's um, fortitude. So with that being said, from that space that I was operating in, I was knocked down time and time and time again. And what I mean by knocked down is I would make money and then something would happen and then I would have to pay off a certain bill or, you know, a car would break down or um, something wouldn't be covered by, you know, the health insurance that I needed or my kids needed or my kids needed braces or, you know, certain things would come up and I'd be like, get two steps forward and then five steps back. But every time I got knocked down, I knew that I was just going to dust myself off and I was going to keep going. And this was just a lesson that taught me on how things didn't work or that how I could navigate against roadblocks. And essentially, that's how I operate even now to this day. So if you something happens in your life and you get knocked down and you have to pay a bill or you, you know, something happens with your health and you can't work out and your body, you know, you start to feel like your body goals are going backwards. Always know that when you can dust yourself off, pick yourself up and keep moving forward, you're going to make forward progress. If you can just take those lessons and those perceived failures and really use them as jet fuel to propel you forward and ignite you on ways that things possibly didn't go right, but all the things that can possibly go right now and taking it forward and moving forward in a way that's going to be positive and less like pessimistic, right? Keeping an optimistic point of view is very, very important in building your confidence. Now, that's just a sampling of how I've used my past history and how I've grown up literally coming from nothing. And my goals being at the time, like, I just want to pay my bills and have extra for my nails. I want to get my nails done or I want to get my hair done. It was like little tiny baby goals I would set for myself financially. I would put money in savings or I wanted to open up, you know, some education accounts for my children. So that way they had money in accounts when they wanted to go to college. And I was able to do these things by work, reworking my mindset and believing that there was enough to go around financially and I was worthy of it. So a lot of my mindset started really early on from just training myself to see a better way instead of seeing the negative and feeling like my job was just a fixed income. I was always trying to find other ways to make money. I had an eBay store. I would sell things on, at the time it wasn't marketplace, but you would sell things on, you know, online through either like MySpace or Facebook. I'd put ads in in the paper when I was trying to get rid of things. And so I was always trying to make a little bit of extra coin and uh, allocate that to certain things for me to be able to level up even more, right? We'll talk about hiring coaches and outsourcing things here in a second as well as a benefit to improving your confidence. But when it came to just kind of shifting gears a little bit, 
when it came to body confidence, which I know is a lot of the reason why most of you guys are here listening to me, right, is fitness things, health things, body things. But when it came to body confidence, y'all, that was not something I had, right? I was a teen mom early. I was once well over 200 pounds. You know, I did not come from a family where we were like eating healthy, fresh, organic, grass fed like meals, right? It was like whatever's on sale, And usually it was like tuna helper, hamburger helper, and fish sticks, macaroni and cheese, anything that was packaged, processed, and like really quick and cheap. That was how I grew up. So as I became a young woman with my young children, I was just mirroring how I grew up, right? I think a lot of times we think, oh, well, I'm just genetically meant to be overweight because my parents are. I don't know that I believe that 100%. In fact, I don't. I oftentimes say, it's less about genetics. It's more about repeating the behaviors and the habits that you were raised with. And so unless you learn better, you typically don't do better. So I made it a habit to continually stretch outside my comfort zone, to learn better about how to eat better, how to move better. And that, you guys, came by way of magazines, okay? It was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fitness magazines, health magazines, cooking magazines, anything I could get my hands on uh, to improve the quality of my body and obviously my health as a byproduct. I was doing that at a very, very, at least I felt for myself, young age with small children because I knew that I knew what I wanted to look like. I knew what I wanted my body to feel like, and I was not feeling like that. And so this is how I brought that forward for myself. Now. The second half of this was once I started doing those things and getting more involved into fitness and then eventually becoming aware of this amazing form of body confidence (laughs) is sensual movement, right? Exotic dance, sensual movement, pole dancing, and things like that, which I know you're probably like hard rolling your eyes. And I was too at the time because I came from a conservative Portuguese background and like that's not something that was like talked about, right? We didn't for definitely didn't talk about sex and and being confident and owning your body. So when I started teaching it, it kind of happened as a byproduct. Now, when I started my central movement journey, I had zero experience, y'all. I I couldn't even have sex with the lights on. I didn't want my partner seeing me undress. I would change in the bathroom. So it was uh definitely something that I dove into scared as fuck right? Like my sister and I started the pole dancing business having zero idea on how to do any of those things. We literally learned on DVDs and it was one of these faking it until we became it. And that's what we did. And as soon as I started getting into the central movement piece of things, as awkward as I felt, as goofy as it felt, as foreign as touching my own body felt, the more that I did it, the easier it became. And then it started to translate into every other area of my life. And it led me to be able to love and appreciate my body, regardless of what society tells me is is an appropriate body shape or size to be. And honestly, what I was telling myself too, like I told myself, you know, like, oh, I'll only be happy when I'm a size four or whatever. And If you followed me for long enough, you've seen my body has come in various different shapes and sizes depending on when I'm competing and when I'm not competing. And throughout that process, um, there has definitely been ups and downs. But the fact that I've anchored to my confidence via central movement and like being very present in my body and my feminine energy has translated into confidence beyond what I had ever expected if you would have asked me 20 years ago. So. When it comes to body confidence, something I ask people, do you want more body confidence? Yes. Okay, great. How do we get there? Now, when it comes to body confidence, I have found in my experience, and honestly with lots of things besides body confidence, but I have to think about what are the things that make me nervous (laughs) or they're kind of scary right? What's a little intimidating? Oh, I could never do that. That would be embarrassing. I would feel silly. I would feel stupid, right? A lot of those things, honestly, spoiler alert, these are stupid stories that we tell ourselves over and over again until we believe them. And then we believe them, 
until we decide to challenge our old ways of thinking. So what I would do is I was doing the shit that scared me over and over again until it wasn't scary. So that meant taking um, DVDs and doing, if I showed you the plethora of DVDs I have, it's like Carmen Electra. (laughs) It's all these things from back in the day and body movements that were very, very different, not traditional. There was like exotic dance DVDs, lap dance DVDs, striptease DVDs, pole dancing, everything I could possibly get my hands on. I inundated myself with that until it just became second nature and I started doing it. And I started worrying less and less about what it looked like and being more concerned about what it felt like and how it made me feel when I was done. That was the biggest takeaway. How do I feel when I'm done with this? How do I feel if I'm not being conscious of myself, right? Self-conscious, right? Put those two words together. Conscious of myself. And I just set that aside while I'm participating in this and just enjoy the process and know that it's not going to look perfect and it doesn't need to be. And when I'm done, It's like flying. It's like being on top of the world, right? So when you think about people who are confident, the question you have to ask yourself is, and I think this is a great place for you to actually journal. Journaling has been paramount in my progress in so many areas of my life because it sets the tone for not only my day, but also my self-conscious, my subconscious. So I oftentimes am like, if I was confident, how would I be behaving? How would I be talking to myself? How would I be thinking? How would I be acting? Again, how do I speak to myself? That's probably the most important thing because if you're speaking to yourself negatively and like you're insecure all the time, you're going to portray that out to the world. It's going to be the beacon you send out to the world. Is that what you want to be sending out into the world? How do you talk about yourself in front of others? That's super important, right? Especially in your female circles where we're supposed to be building each other up. And when you receive compliments, like how are you accepting that? How are you acknowledging that without dimming your light, but also um, embracing, embracing where you've come and where you're headed? The other thing I want you to think about is when you think of somebody who's very confident, how is their posture? How do they behave in their most vulnerable moments, right? And and for myself, like how was I how was I showing up in my most vulnerable moments, which a lot of times that's like being intimate with a partner, you know, or being in a crowd with other women where you might feel vulnerable because you might feel like you're not as pretty as this girl or you're not as confident as this girl. You know, whatever your insecurities are, if you are speaking those and you're feeling those in your most vulnerable moments, that's going to show up for you. The other thing I want you to consider if you are looking for more body confidence is that I want you to know that we need to approach this with an abundance mindset. And what I mean by that is that just because other women around you are confident does not mean that you cannot be, right? Let's not go into this with scarcity. Like there's not enough confidence to go around, okay? Like if I'm confident, that doesn't mean you can't also be confident. That doesn't mean we can't be in the same space and also be very confident. You know, four of my very best friends are four of the most confident people I know. And when we all hang out together, we like rise up together, right? We are each other's hype women. If you are not hanging out with hype women, get yourself a new crowd of friends because the other ones are crabs and you know how I feel about crabs. So don't shrink for others to shine. You want to shine bright enough and lift people along with you. Okay, this is going to increase your vibration in the world, the energy that you bring to the world as who you are and who you show up as is so important. So think about that when it comes to what you're wanting to project with your own confidence. Now, maybe you're looking for more confidence in your ability to make money. I'm learning a lot more and more about the power of your mindset when it comes to money and abundance and things like that. I'm spending a lot of time in this chapter of my life really focusing on abundance and bringing in some interesting and fun things into my life. And so with that, I have to think about some things. How do people with money act? How do they talk? How do they think? 
How do they behave? What do they do? What kinds of things do they read? What kinds of things do they listen to? How do they speak about money, right? Usually those that want to be successful and make more money don't have a scarcity mindset. They typically have an abundance mindset. There is enough money to go around for everyone. If you're constantly thinking in scarcity or there's not enough or I'm not going to have enough, you tend to attract what you think about. And I know that this sounds crazy and it sounds very much like The Secret, which if you haven't watched it, you probably should. But you can't look at setbacks in terms of your progress, maybe with your financial um, your financial goals in a scarcity mindset. If you're constantly thinking, oh, I knew it was too good to be true, or of course I have the worst luck, stop saying that shit. You're going to continue to manifest that into your life, right? Change your way of thinking to that's one way things didn't work. Let's course correct and try again. Should you come up against any kind of financial setbacks, you know, you miss the mark on hitting financial targets or goals or, uh, you know, advances in your career or promotions and things like that just wasn't the right opportunity. There's a better one for me. You have to keep looking for the positive and the next best opportunity or else you're going to be anchored into that past mindset and that way of being and that's not going to serve you moving forward. Okay, we've talked about my personal confidence journey, understanding what confidence means. Let's dive into faking confidence versus building genuine confidence, building genuine confidence. So important, right? Now, I know I've talked about faking it till you make it or be it till you see it. And there is some piece of that that is valid, but there has to be a deep sense of knowing that even though you might feel like you're faking it, you genuinely believe that about yourself. And sometimes it just takes that practice of doing it before you're truly 100% confident with it before it starts to become a fiber of your intricate DNA. Okay. Now, the the short-term benefits of faking that confidence is that it can lead you to some opportunities, right? Some positive outcomes. There have been so many times where I have faked my confidence and I can even speak to that with just the podcast as an example, right? Reaching out to certain guests where I thought they'll never want to be on my podcast. Who the fuck am I, right? And By faking that confidence while knowing I have a platform and a mission that I'm trying to share and get out into the world by reaching out to these people who are maybe a far stretch to get on my podcast and being and owning that confidence has gotten me really far in getting some pretty awesome guests on the podcast. And also knowing that the ones that said no, that doesn't make it doesn't mean anything about me. It just means that they weren't a good fit right now. It does not mean it's going to be a forever no. I don't ever fully slam doors shut. That's the thing when it comes to opportunities. I just say it's not a no. It's just a no right now. Okay. So you have to really think with this confidence, even though you feel like you're partially faking it. Now, one thing that is a drawback to faking confidence is it can lead to imposter syndrome. So you can't live in this fake confidence all the time. It can make you feel a little bit anxious, like, oh, this is not genuine. It doesn't feel authentic. And so it could pose a little bit of a challenge. So I don't live in that fake confidence uh, mindset for eternity. I just keep projecting forward and moving forward. And as I achieve other small wins, it feels less and less like it's a fake it till you make it. And I'm just being it. I'm being it until I'm seeing it. Okay. So the path to genuine confidence, again, is building that authentic confidence through self-awareness, being very, very honest with yourself, very self-aware, continued self-improvement. So I'm not just wishing it into the world and like things are falling into my lap. I'm still, there's a saying like, when you pray, move your feet, 
right? And and that might resonate with you and it may not just depending on whatever. And I'm not necessarily of like high religious belief, but when you are putting things into the universe and things that you want to achieve and you're trying to manifest things and build confidence in areas of your life, that's not going to come by way of you just wishing it. You still have to do the work. So self-improvement, making steps, taking steps forward, doing the work, and this will build as time goes on. So it's important to know what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. And there is this, there are very different schools of thought. Some schools of thoughts are, you know, hone in and improve your weaknesses. And I used to believe in that to the depth of my core for many, many years. And then I started listening to some other people who were successful and they oftentimes mention how building on your strengths is actually where your magic lies. Where are your strengths? Improve on those, hone in on those. And what are the weaknesses? Are they worth exploring? Are they work, worth trying to make into strengths? Are those things that we can either close the door on and not not uh, go down the path of trying to you know, improve those weaknesses? Can we outsource things to improve those weaknesses? So there's other ways to look at your weaknesses. But I'm going to tell you right now, My focus is on my strengths. It's not on my weaknesses. So the way that I lead my life when I sit down and I look at my to-do list and I look at my goals, it's where are my strengths and how can I catapult those into success? So my question to you, have you ever faked confidence? What were the results? And how is that working for you? I would love to know. Share your thoughts with me. You know where to find me. Okay, next we're going to move into some tactical tips to help you boost your confidence. Now, this is going to look different depending on where you're trying to improve your confidence. But when it comes to improving your confidence in certain areas, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to give you some tips. We meaning me. Job interviews and professional settings, right? So, some things to boost your confidence when you are going into job interviews or professional settings. Anytime I have a guest on my podcast, do your research. Go into that knowing the things that you need to know to appear confident, knowledgeable, and like you should be selected for the role. Practice interview questions, look online for potential, you know, possibly some job interview uh, questions that might come up. And you have to present yourself confidently. And this goes along with also your body language, mirroring the person who's interviewing you, and really meeting them with their energy instead of just being lackluster and not knowing anything and then potentially standing out in a negative way. When I'm doing a um, an interview or let's say there's a job interview, every job that I've ever interviewed for, I've always got, which is great. But I also went in knowing and feeling like I deserved that role. I deserve that job. So it's also a lot of self pep talk. Okay. Now, when it comes to boosting confidence in social gatherings and networking events, this is usually more of a challenge for me because I'm an introvert by nature. Big groups aren't usually my jam. I do better with like small intimate groups or, you know, one-on-one settings with people. But strategies for initiating conversations are very, very important with building confidence there, right? Listening, active listening. So this is something that I worked really, really hard on, especially as I was transitioning more into the online space and doing interviews and people were asking to interview me for certain things like news shows and certain things online and Instagram and collabs that I've done is how can I be of service to either somebody who might be listening to my interview? How can I share something valuable? How can I be more present? And so it was really being where my feet were, right? You you guys have heard me talk about that, being very mindful and present and listening. My dad used to tell me, God gave you two ears to listen twice as hard as you speak. And I didn't get that for a really, really long time. And then I'd say probably the last 15 years, I've cultivated an ability to really listen 
pick up things in conversations, ask more questions and be interested rather than trying to be interesting. Okay. So when you can approach a gathering and a network event on how can I be interested in this person and less focused on talking about me, 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 and I'm so interesting and I'm so important. I've done all these things. This is a great way to build connections and build rapport with people and build your confidence in social situations. Also helps you find common grounds, right? Common grounds and similarities with other people. This works really great for sales, by the way. Now, when it comes to building confidence with public speaking and presentations, this one I also can put in here like getting on stage, right? And feeling comfortable on stage when it comes to performing as a competitor. That shit did not come natural for me. I was not an athlete in school. I did not do sports. I did not, you know, I wasn't on the debate team. Like I barely passed high school and I did through homeschooling because I had my son when I was a junior in high school. So I didn't have any exposure to team sports or any kind of ability to feel confident on a stage setting. Yet I've been on stage 16 times in a very tiny bikini and I fucking love it. How did I do that? Well, I learned how to manage my anxiety, which was a big piece of that. And I knew that I wasn't going to let my anxiety be the thing that held me back from achieving things and trying to be an IFBB pro and getting on stage and and really owning that. I was not going to let my anxiety get the best of me. I wasn't going to let it win. Okay. So I'm not necessarily a competitive person when it comes to Um, when I'm on stage, I'm like, oh, I'm going to beat everybody. Or, you know, I never played sports. So I never had that competitiveness about me with other people. However, I get very competitive with myself. And how can I be better than I was last time? How can I overcome this thing that stopped me the last time? Or how did I get in my own way? And fuck that bitch. Like, uh uh-uh, we're going to move forward. We're going to be a boss bitch. And how do we do that? We educate ourselves on how to manage anxiety and we practice, right? We're only going to get better by practicing. So I would practice over and over and over again on doing shit that was scary because I knew if I could keep doing those things, those small touch things, when the big things came, like getting on stage in front of thousands of people and, you know, hundreds of people for my pro card and all these multiple avenues of stage and, and whatnot, that I would be prepared for managing my anxiety and doing scary shit. So when it comes to public speaking and presentations for myself, for example, if you go onto the YouTube or you find my blog, livingthegoddesslife.com, which is kind of archaic at this point, but you could go back and find dozens and dozens and dozens of old blogs. I think I've got 300 videos by now on YouTube. And my very first, one of my first handful of videos is like how to be more confident and how to, I think if that's what it's called, kind of silly, but uh, it'd be awesome if if Alexis can find that on YouTube. And Alexis is my podcast manager. She's amazing. And she can link it in the show notes for my very first YouTube video. It's fucking terrible. It's terrible. But the point is, is I was doing my reps. I had to do the reps needed to be able to be here today, to sit in front of a mic and have a general outline of what I'm going to talk about, but also like have passion and, you know, excitement and not be nervous and and feel empowered to be confident to do this. Even if there's people judging me, listening to me, I'm like, oh my God, this girl, she says like a hundred times. She's a Valley girl. She's from California. She says I'm a thousand times. Perfect. But guess what I'm doing that a lot of people aren't doing? I'm doing the work. I'm showing up. I'm getting behind the mic. I'm getting on stage. I'm ma- I'm circling laps around those who are just crippled by fear and the worry of other people's criticism to do anything. And that's the true definition to me of a boss bitch is when you can be empowered to do the scary shit anyways and fucking make life happen for yourself and carry a mindset about you that is like, that's great if you think that about me, but I don't right? So let's do that together. (laughs) All right. Next is um, in the other way that you can build and boost your confidence is dealing when you're, you're dealing with criticism and setbacks, right? I hear that often. Like, how do you deal with haters or people that are judgy and things like that? I just don't engage, right? I like, who are they to me? Nobody. Like, what does that even mean? Like, if you're taking the time to criticize me, 
you better ask yourself, like, what are you doing that's exponentially larger and bigger than me in life that really affords you the ability to have an opinion on what I'm doing? Okay, great. Goodbye. <laughs> right. So think of it that way. I listen to feedback. I listen to feedback for those that I from those that I care about, the people that I know have my best interest in mind, my group, my group of friends that I know is rooting for me to just, you know, achieve all the things in my life. But I also take it as an opportunity for growth too. I don't think I'm perfect and I know that there's always going to be a blind spot somewhere. So it's knowing that you can take things at face value and just not internalize that and make it mean anything about me as a person and moving forward. Now, the other thing that's probably going to be a little more woo-woo and a little bit like conceptual is I really want you to think about how you talk about yourself to yourself. So positive self-talk, self-affirmations, these are things that I try to really dive into daily by way of journaling. If not journaling, I'm listening to something that is going to encourage me to um, think high rate vibration thoughts about myself and abundance and whatever area that is in my life, whether that's in my relationships, in my personal um, goals with my fitness or my business goals, positive self-talk. It doesn't come by way of the fact that I was fed this shit my whole life. I love my parents dearly. They're amazing humans, but they're also sometimes not the most positive. They focus on a lot of the negative shit that's going on in the world. And so if I just embraced what they said and I lived my life like that all the time, I would be in a very different spot than I am now. And it would not be a positive one. Okay. It would, it would definitely affect uh, my mindset. So Cultivate your confidence by positive self-talk and also speaking those words. Even again, right now, if you're not feeling it, you have to start somewhere. Setting these affirmations as daily practices for you to build your confidence is very, very key into boosting your own personal confidence, okay? So one thing I invite you to do is share one specific situation where you'd like to feel more confident. And what is one actionable step that you can take to achieve that confidence? You could do this through Instagram. You can come and I answer every single DM. So come over and tell me like, hey, I listened to your your podcast on confidence. This is what I'm working on and this is what I'm going to do, right? This is what I'm doing to overcome that confidence. I would love to hear your stories. You guys are what keeps my fire burning, all right? Okay, let's move on to my favorite part of this podcast, which is overcoming imposter syndrome. So overcoming imposter syndrome, what does imposter syndrome even mean? By definition, a pervasive feeling of inadequacy and a fear of being exposed as a fraud despite your accomplishments. Okay, let me repeat that. A pervasive feeling of inadequacy and a fear of being exposed as a fraud despite your accomplishments. That hits home. That's really, really big because I, even speaking that into the mic, have felt that. I get the chills thinking about how I have thought many times in the course of my life and my career as, man, I am inadequate you know, people are going to find out I'm a fraud. And it's hilarious to me because I've done all the things and it still sometimes feels like who the fuck am I to, to be telling people that they, you know, they need to chase their goals. They need to chase their body goals. They need to show up in the world how they want uh, to be perceived with a confident mindset, right? When sometimes this stuff still sneaks up for me. I'm not perfect, but I, I'm human and I notice it. And the difference is, is that I don't sit in it and I take action. So I will tell you that most successful people that I know have come up against the imposter syndrome feeling. I've worked with many coaches, my own business coaches who are incredibly successful, uh, women who compete, women who have achieved IFBB pro status, my own athletes that have achieved IFBB pro status, where they still have this nagging feeling of imposter syndrome. So it does get better. I, I don't know that it'll entirely go away, but it gets more and more faint as time goes on, that whisper of imposter syndrome. Now, it's a gradual process of overcoming it. And again, one that I haven't conquered entirely, but I have 
definitely made tremendous improvement on is having that self-awareness, having a deep amount of self-compassion, which is challenging sometimes for me, and adopting positive habits, which we've talked a lot about already in this podcast. So here's some things. I'm also going to give you some examples on how to overcome imposter syndrome, okay? So number one is you got to recognize and acknowledge the feelings, being aware of them when they arise. Think about these thoughts, these feelings, and if they're common, and remember that they don't define your true abilities or your worth. Now, mine was, I'm a single mom, I don't have a college degree, I'm not worthy, all these things. And all I had was just a passion and an obsession with health and fitness and mindset. And what eventually led to an obsession with empowering other women because I achieved those things and I wanted it for every woman that I met. And so when those feelings came up, I knew, yes, I feel these things. And also, I know that there's a better way. And I'm going to keep working on that. Even though I know I don't feel 100% about myself right now, I know that it's not determining my worth. I know I'm very worthy of these things and these feelings, these great feelings. But it's going to be a process in getting there. The second thing is I would reframe those negative thoughts. So you have to challenge those negative thoughts about yourself. Is this true? What makes that true? Question your thoughts. Dig deep. Okay, then you need to replace the self-doubt with, again, what we talked about earlier, positive affirmations. Also focusing on the things that you have done, which I know for myself is one of the harder things for me to do is to look back and really celebrate my achievements and the things that I've overcome and the things that I have achieved and that I'm looking to achieve. It's really hard for me. This is one spot that I'm working on in my life. And, you know, if you if you've overcome this, I would love for you to to give me your uh, your tips. But I do know that when I have any of the negative thoughts, I know that those do not define who I am and the value that I can bring into someone's life. So I know that for certain. And also when I'm having any kind of fear around celebrating my achievements, the go-to that I have right now is there's always room for improvement. There's always more. There's always, that's what feeds me forward And I also need to take time to look back at my achievements, right? I've achieved a whole hell of a lot considering where I started from, at least to my standards. So taking time to celebrate that occasionally is very, very important. And to know that if you've done these things, you can certainly do do more and reach for the stars. Now, the other step in overcoming your imposter syndrome is sharing how you're feeling, which can be a very big space of vulnerability. So a lot of times I will take these feelings to my business coaches, um, some of my trusted friends who I know that will be my hype women, right? And also not just tell me what I want to hear, but tell me what I need to hear, which is super important. So sharing your experiences can help provide you some support, some reassurance, and It will also show you that some other people that you probably look to as as really successful also have felt the same way at some point in their time. So think about that. For me, again, finding influential, influential people with similar stories is super important. And also thinking to myself, if they can turn it around, so can I. And if they can achieve that thing, why can't I? Why does that make them any different? You know, at the end of the day, we all put our pants on. We all put our yoga pants on the same way, one leg at a time. So if she can do it, why can't I? So sharing your feelings, talking about it with friends, family, mentors, super key in knowing that you can overcome your imposter feelings, your feelings of imposter syndrome. One other key to to overcoming this is understanding where is this coming from for you? What are the root causes of your imposter syndrome, right? Right. Often it can be related to a perfectionism. You got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. Oh my gosh, you guys, stop with that already. You know how many times I've done a thing without it being perfect and knowing 100% the outcome of everything? Like every decision I make, I'm like, well, 
we're going to rip the band-aid and see what happens. And guess what? It's all figure outable. So it could be that. It could be it could be a fear of failure. It could be your expectations are way too high. And so therefore you just stay stuck, right? So knowing where that's coming from will let you af- address it more effectively. So I know one of mine that tends to come up or has before, it's not so much, it's more of a whisper now, is my imposter syndrome was rooted in the fact that like my parents were immigrants, my odds were stacked against me, no one's going to listen to me because I didn't have a perfect life. I didn't, you know, don't have a master's degree or PhD or, you know, all these things. And if my business fails, you know, that just confirms I'm not good enough. And that's just like, can we just LOL altogether? Like, that's just absolute bullshit, right? The story of who you were does not mean that that's how the story ends. And you don't have to carry that story with you because if you do, it's like a roadblock into achieving what you want to have in your life. So remember that. Think about that. Just because that was you or that is your story or that is your history or your your parents' history, that does not need to make it true for you moving forward. You can rewrite your story And remember to build off of your past as your bedrock and your foundation for your strength and not necessarily the mindset that you had back then or in regards to that is not the mindset that you have to embody going forward. You can literally change your mind at any time. You can just decide today that that is no longer serving you and you can just stop thinking that way. It's really that easy. And then once those thoughts creep back up, it's up to you to be mindful and aware that they're creeping up and you just shove them right back where they were and replace those thoughts with positive affirmations and projecting forward into a life that you want to live. Next is setting realistic goals. So if you set very unrealistic goals and overly ambitious goals, your imposter syndrome alert is going to be sky high, right? So you have to break bigger goals, bigger tasks into smaller, achievable, bite-sized chunks and also celebrate those little wins along the way. So for myself personally, I took it one step at a time. I would set a big goal and it would it would like overwhelm me for a minute. I'd be like, fuck, I don't know how I'm going to do that. But I'm just going to set that in motion. I'm going to put it on paper. I'm going to say it out loud. And then I'm going to reverse engineer that the best way I know how. And it might not end up how I envisioned it as far as the goal, but we're going to do our damn best. Okay. I would start chipping away. So two very important goals that I've set in my life that stand out for this conversation is... When I first started my business, I thought I want to be able to make more money than my day job. Okay. So my day job, I worked almost 10 years in the medical field for a a specialist here in town. And I also had a side hustle of medical transcription, which I was like, when I'd been done working eight hours, I would come home and then I would, for two to three hours more, I would work from home and I would do medical transcript reports from home. And that brought me an extra couple grand in a month on top of my already like day, you know, Monday through Friday job. And then there was also a point where I had a side hustle where I was working that day job with the daycare job. And so I knew that I wanted to make more money. I knew that money would afford me more freedom in my life. I would be able to do more things for my children and also not having me living paycheck to paycheck in this like scarcity mode. So When I started my business, I had already quit my day job and I was just doing medical transcription because I was pregnant and I had like a complicated pregnancy. And so my my income went down significantly. And then at that point, I started some side hustles with like an eBay store and selling things on Craigslist and things of that nature. And so I was basically making about the same money as I did in when I had my day job and my side hustle. Hopefully you're following the story. But when I decided to follow my passions, chase my dreams, I was kind of straddling both for a little bit, right? And we've talked about this with Coach Glitter because, you know, she's been working for me for quite some time and I've been trying her for her to rip the Band-Aid, quit her job that she had for 18 years and come work for me because I knew once she did, I was going to be able to 
catapult her into making more money than she did in her day job. I just knew it. Like I, that was my goal for her as well, right? So when I started my business, it was a side hustle and I was doing, my sister and I were doing pole part, pole dancing parties for women for like bachelorette parties, divorce parties, birthday parties, that thing on the weekends, right? So this was like a new side hustle. And I did both for a while. I did the medical transcription and I did the pole dancing. And I did that for about three years of my business because I was so afraid to let go of the one the one thing that I had that I knew was a consistent stream of income, which was my medical transcription, and fully dive into my business. So my goal was is that I wanted to be able to make more than my day job when I started my business and I ripped the Band-Aid and went full time, right? I'm like, I'm going to go all in on this pole dancing studio thing and fucking let's see what happens, right? Mind you, zero business experience. My parents don't know shit about business. I have no business degrees. I have no role models in my life that own a business, nothing. This was me and my best confidant, Google, okay? Figuring out my life. My first year, solid year of business without my side hustles, I actually made $20,000 more that year than I did the year prior. Now, this was, I don't even know, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. And since then, I have now 16x'd that revenue, okay? So this is just to show you that, and this is these are true numbers, is that when you can set a goal and reverse engineer that, you can make shit happen. You just have to take one step at a time. And I did not know you know, all those years ago that I would be here. But every single year, um, every single year and intermittently through the year, I sit down and I manifest what I want to achieve for the next year, the things that I want, the goals that I have. One of my goals last year was I want to, or no, this was two years ago, I believe. I want to be able to travel at least one weekend a month, every single month. And I have been doing that on average. Some months I've had traveled none and some months I've traveled like two or three times. And while some of this is directly related to my work, I love my work. So it's also enjoyable and a fun experience. And I'm getting to experience new cities and things like that, as well as have some leisure travel in there too. So I set that goal and it has been, I've manifested and it's been happening. I just make it happen, right? So that was one in terms of success. And then I have multiple goals moving forward, but we're not going to talk about that just yet. The second thing is that I wanted to be a competitor. I wanted to be an athlete. I wanted to get on stage and I did not know how that was going to happen. I didn't know anybody that competed, nothing. And so once I started that, then my goal shifted to, I want to become an IFBB pro. I also manifested ahead of time that in, in the present tense, in a journal, every time I competed or I was in prep, I would manifest what I wanted my outcome to be. I wanted to get top five. I wanted to get first call outs. I wanted to get first place. And I wrote about in the present tense as if it has already happened. Now, I'm going to tell you, I got to find my journal entry from my last manifestation on stage, which was my pro debut. And I put in there very specifically that I wanted to have top call outs and I wanted to have, I wanted to to get fifth place on my pro debut. Guess what happened? I got top call outs and I got fifth place. Now, call it what you want, but I'm going to tell you there is something very, very big about journaling, manifesting, and putting things into your self-conscious, okay? So next, focusing on learning and growth is super important. Again, embracing that growth mindset to getting out of imposter syndrome. So I always view challenges and setbacks as opportunities for learning and improvement, hands down every time. I don't look at it as, you know, oh, you're a failure or you're inadequate. So for me, when shit does not work, we course correct and we see what the next move will be. And we do not sit in that inadequacy feeling. We move forward. Next internalize your positive feedback. What are the accomplishments that you've achieved? What are the compliments you're getting? The positive feedback. Be gracious about that. Don't dismiss praise. Internalize it. Let and reinforce your belief in your abilities. This is something I'm working on still. 
I have this fear that if I accept it, it'll be gone. So I, I, it helps me stay hungry, but I'm getting better. My business coach is working with me on this in terms of taking some breaks and celebrating um, achievements. And I'm doing doing better about doing this with my team when we, ha- we hit certain goals and certain numbers. Um, and they're doing fantastic as well. So that's super important. Next is avoiding comparisons, right? So don't sit there and perpetually compare yourself to others. You have to remember everyone has their strengths and weaknesses nobody is perfect. So I used to do this often, but now this is what I invite you to do is rather than comparing, I want you to look at other people and the things that they have, or maybe things that you're envious of as motivation as to, well, if they can do it, so can I, or why not me, right? The next piece of this is keeping a success journal. So I like to record my achievements, my successes, my moments where I feel very, very confident because I want more of that. So my journals are often filled with pages of positive things that I want, what's not working, how can I reframe that? And you can refer back to this when you have moments of self-doubt, which are often, it happens to me all of the time. One tool that I'm loving right now is the full focus journal. And this is a great one to remind you of what you're doing right. This is a new journal I'm using. Um, I do have, you know, some things that like aren't my favorite about it, but the the premise of it is wonderful. It doesn't have enough space because obviously I I talk a lot. I also write a lot. So one page is a list of a lot of questions that'll prompt you to think about what you're doing right, the things, your wins, your successes. And this is really good for me personally, because I know that that is one area that I have a challenge with. Next is seeking support and mentoring. Again, supportive individuals who believe in you, guidance from mentors, coaches, people that will provide you with insights and encouragement. Definitely do not sleep on this. The second that I could afford to hire somebody who already did what I wanted, I did that. So Coaches, I have had so many coaches over my lifetime in business, in fitness, in mindset, in speaking, in just improving my communication skills, education. I can't even tell you. I've had I've had more than I can count on two hands how many coaches I've had in a lifetime that have served me in different areas. And all of them I have learned something very important from, even my fitness coaches, okay? So like my, my bodybuilding coaches and things of that nature. So The second I could allocate funds into hiring somebody, I did. And it felt weird and silly. And let me tell you, when you have somebody holding your ass accountable for certain things, you get shit done. Okay. When you pay, you pay attention. If I set goals by myself and I'm like, oh, that's fine. I didn't achieve that. No big deal. No one's coming for me. But when I know my business coach or my relationship coach or my speaking coach have set certain things that they want to see me achieve, it pushes me. Okay. It pushes me and it scares me a little bit, makes me pucker my butthole a little bit. And I'm like, I don't want to let them down. I'm going to do this shit. I'll let myself down. (laughs) You know, like I'm sure you can uh, uh, relate to that. Like I'll be quick to let myself down, but I'm not letting down a coach. Right. So super important. Then we move into the next piece, which I feel has been super helpful, which is helping others when you are feeling like you have this imposter syndrome right? It helps you boost your self-esteem. So when I'm having feelings of self-doubt, I am like, okay, I cannot live in this space. This is not conducive to my lifestyle, my mentality, my positive mindset. What can I do right now to motivate somebody or inspire somebody to take action? This then motivates me back. If I know that I have helped somebody in some small way, so sometimes it'll be a matter of me sitting in these feelings and I'll go on Instagram and I will share some tool that I'm using right now that's really helpful or a meal hack or a podcast or a workout tip or whatever. And I get some feedback from you guys. That's like, thank you. That was super helpful. Fucking great. I love that. These are my words of affirmation that help me realize that being of service to others will also help me battle my own internal imposter syndrome things as they come up as they come up from time to time then we have lastly practicing self compassion now this is challenging because it's really easy for us to be mean to ourselves right or like talking down on ourselves so the best way that i could describe this as for self compassion is what would you tell your bestie right? How would you speak to your bestie 
in terms of, you know, kindness and understanding. And when you have a friend facing similar challenges, are you talking down to them or telling them, yeah, that's too big of a goal. You shouldn't strive for that. You know, who do you think you are? That's ridiculous. Like, probably not. Okay. So you got to think about how would you talk to your bestie? So just remember, these are some great things for you to think about, but it is a journey. Imposter syndrome is a thing and overcoming that takes some time. It's totally normal to have moments of self-doubt, but as you make progress, celebrate that because it's only going to propel your your confidence forward and you're going to feel more authentic in what it is that you have to offer for yourself and to the world. Be patient. Be super, super patient. It's not going to happen overnight. Okay, next we're going to talk about embracing vulnerability and self-acceptance. So vulnerability definitely fosters authentic connections with others, and it it definitely builds trust. I will say that one of the biggest things I hear often from people is they love how authentic I am, that I'm vulnerable, I share, I share my wins, I share my struggles, and I also help you see how this could apply to yourself. So this is very, very key to building trust with people. And and being very vulnerable is challenging. And I know that for certain. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. I, I promise you that. So think of one area of your life where you are struggling with self-acceptance. And what can you do to show yourself a little more compassion in that area And also being vulnerable and sharing that with somebody, you know, how can that help you feel more authentic and not embarrassed or ashamed? It kind of is a superpower, at least in my opinion. So don't be afraid to write yourself some self-affirmations and also engage in mindful practices when you are feeling vulnerable and you have these moments of self-doubt. Next up, we're going to talk about building confidence through skill development, which we touched on a little bit earlier. But again, when you pray, you got to move your feet. So you might want all these crazy things and have these goals and, you know, want to achieve things and maybe your own confidence and self-assurance is holding you back. But there might be a level of skill that you need to acquire. So acquiring some new skills are going to impact how confident you feel moving forward in certain areas. So what courses can you take? Again, what coaches can you hire? What things should you be Googling? What YouTube videos can you be watching in the areas in which you want to build skill and confidence? Super important. This is how I paved my way to do the things that I do is reaching out and improving my skills in some way, shape, or or form. And again, you have to break these into small steps so that way you do not feel overwhelmed and you can tackle it one bite at a time instead of trying to to do everything at once, break it down into bite-sized pieces. So think about this for yourself. What skill would you like to develop to improve your confidence and what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? All right. And then last but certainly not least, something that I am also very passionate about is embodying confidence in your body language. So very, very key. It is very powerful, the connection between your body language and your confidence or your perceived confidence. So specific tips for adapting confidence with your body language, right? Good posture. Are your shoulders slunched forward? Are your are you shuffling your feet? Are you taking big strides? Are you making eye contact? I am obsessed with making eye contact with people and it is so uncomfortable for some folks. But let me tell you, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Make eye contact. If making eye contact feels uncomfortable, stare at people between their eyes. It is still at least in the general vicinity. It will still look like you're making relative eye contact, but it'll get easier. Eye contact, purposeful gestures, you know, creating a power stance, right? I learned about this through, I don't know, one course I took, but having a power stance instead of a closed off stance when you're trying to make connections or, you know, be confident in a room or making a speech or a presentation or a job interview or on a date even, right? And also, ladies, please, please, please have a powerful handshake. This does not mean you need to crush somebody's hand, but I can't tell you how many women I meet that go in with a wet noodle handshake. 
that alone speaks volumes. When you sh- hand, shake hands with another woman, another man, another person, an, a dog, I don't know, don't do this with a meek wet noodle handshake, okay? Go in with some power behind you. Some other things, arms crossed is kind of a closed off body language stance, not making eye contact, stuttering, acting meek. Bitches, we need to own the motherfucking room, okay? When you walk in the room, you want people to know who's the baddest bitch in that room. You have to have boss bitch, bad bitch energy about you. Again, this does not mean cocky. This does not mean, you know, you're being an asshole or dick. You're just being confident in the way you carry yourself and present yourself in the world. So again, be it till you see it, fake it till you make it. Practicing confident body language will definitely influence how others perceive us and in turn impact our own perception of ourselves, right? Like how you show up in any room. How do you show up? So practice confident body language, practice it in front of a mirror, Turn on your camera, record yourself, take courses on confidence, take courses on, you know, many things that are going to improve your skill set when it comes to embodying and and being in your fullest expression of yourself and confidence and notice how it makes you feel. It is super, super empowering. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. I know it was like a lot and I was coming at you. It was supposed to be a 30 minute episode, but you guys, this is something I'm incredibly passionate about. And if anything, I want you to know the importance of confidence and personal growth and success moving forward, whether that's in your personal goals or your body. And I really encourage you to take some action today. Think about the tips I talked about and know that I'm super grateful for you. But I also want you to know that if you are looking to improve body confidence in one of the ways that I've learned how to improve body confidence, I created a central movement program. And this is not a pitch for that, but I'm going to drop the info that will give you a little commercial blurb about it here after this, uh, after this segment. But take a look at it. I would love for you to check it out. Try it out learn how to become confident in your skin and your body and know that your boss bitch journey is just beginning. And I truly believe in you. Fellow boss bitches, spicy boss bitches. If you've known me for some time, you know that I started my foray into my self-confidence by sensual movement and pole dancing. Well, I actually have created a program that I know you are absolutely going to love. This program has all of my heart and soul poured into it, into teaching women how to be sexy and confident in their skin by way of sensual movement. Now, this program will also help translate into feeling more confident in the bedroom. Now, while I want you to do this for yourself, your partner will a thousand percent benefit from this as well. When you tap into this level of confidence within yourself, it is going to pour over into every area of your life. I would love for you to go check it out. My sensual movement program is 37 videos that teaches you step by step. Very basically, there's not like this crazy choreography on how to cultivate confidence. There's some music suggestions in there. I've got 21 videos that are under a minute that explain just the foundational movements really quickly. Then I have some flow videos for you to kind of play around with, and I take you through them step by step. And it's all in a fun, accessible way for you to experience something sexy in the privacy of your own home that you can cultivate and really hone in for yourself. Everything is housed on a lifetime access private membership site, so you'll have access to everything forever. It's like having your own little sexy coach in your back pocket. So I would love for you to go check it out. Let me know what you think, and let's share this sexy little secret together. So it is sensualdancemovement.com. That's where you'll find the program. I will also link that up in the show notes, and I would love for you to dive in and enjoy. Enjoy.